And can you guys see that now? Yep, it looks great. Okay, cool. So, all right, awesome, guys. I guess most of the residents are MUSC residents, right? Right now, yes. It looks like okay. one um, person who's not. So. Okay, all right, we'll make this really quick. It's going to be like resident boot camp for skull-based osteomyelitis. So most of you probably think, oh, my God, this is just, just the least sexy topic, you know, instead of cochlear implant. But as a uh, as a resident, I actually saw very few osteomyelitis. I think as a new young attending, I'm currently at University of Florida. I went to Miami for train uh, residency and house for fellowship. So as a resident and fellow, I saw barely any osteomyelitis. And now in my practice, I don't have a giant share, but every single one of them if you ever seen one of them is a, a, a significant painful experience. So the topic today, the subtitle is actually how to survive the haunted house since the Halloween was just yesterday. So uh, let's begin. I have no financial disclosures and I would share with you a case that really brought on to my deep dive into the osteomyelitis world because this patient has really haunted me for about a year and a half. So I was a 62 year old male who presented with otalgia and otorrhea. Um, a month ago, he actually at an outside institution had bilateral myringotomy choose place for hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which he was getting for a diabetic foot ulcer, if that tells you a lot about this patient already. Ever since then, he has experienced severe otalgia and uh, purulent otorrhea, and he was seen in ED, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, they diagnosed him with bilateral mastoiditis and started him ofloxacin drops and augmentin, which is very appropriate for, you know, mastoiditis. He has significant past medical history, including uh, diabetes and renal transplant, so he's immunosuppressed. And when he showed up to my exam, uh, to my clinic, the exam was significant for bilateral, extremely swollen shot EAC, um, the facial nerve was normal, and the rest of the exam was normal. And this was the CT scan he brought in from the outside ED, you know, bilateral mastery opacification. There was maybe some early signs of bony erosion, but really hard to say. It just looks like opacify. He could very well have mastoiditis. But the pain he was experiencing, you know, if you ask him, he was like 100 out of 10. It was so severe, he was just begging to be admitted. So in the clinic, what I ended up doing was taking a culture of both ears. If you're seeing those patients in the ED as a consult, as a resident, uh, definitely consider taking an ear cultures and they explain why in a moment. They were so swollen that I had to put ear wicks in both sides. Um, and he was so uncomfortable that I admit him to actually to the me medicine floor, but uh, for IV antibiotics and to get some repeat scans. Uh, we culture him. Uh, in the clinic and then again in, uh, in the hospital waiting for the cultures to grow, but they actually were negative. Nothing grew on both cultures, which is a very extremely frustrating experience if you are, um, you know, waiting for cultures and for the infectious diseases is just waiting to um, downgrade. PCT scan, um, the repeat CT scan, I don't know if you see the arrow, my arrow, is starting to see bony erosions. It's incredible that you're starting to see bony erosions within a couple weeks. Um, compared to the old CT scan, you're seeing some bone, cortical bone losses. Um, and that's highly suggestive of uh, uh, skull-based osteomyelitis when they actually went and had and got a nuclear medicine scan, which confirmed we will go into a little bit more details about the nuclear medicine scan. Um, because his cultures were sterile twice and he was on IV vancomycin, cefepime, and metronidazole, the uh, transplant team were just frustrated with me. They really want you to downgrade to obtain tissue for biopsy and culture. So I did take him from a left mastoid for biopsy and culture, which finally, thank God, grew pseudomonas. And he was discharged home on Levaquin or Flocacin, and the infectious disease recommendation was for eight weeks. You know, I didn't really think about it at the time. I was a new attending. I was like, oh my God, thank God he's out of the hospital. I don't, we, the team doesn't have to worry about him anymore. Um, his antibiotics were stopped. Um, and the three month follow up, he was perfectly fine. There was, the ear canals were widely open. He didn't have any pain. He was extremely thankful. We were going to be best friends. And then a month later, he came back with severe pain and left facial paralysis my world was about to fall apart. What did I do wrong? What happened? And this is what that one case that triggered me to go into this deep dive for osteomyelitis. So there is a lot of confusion about what is it uh, that we consider osteomyelitis at the skull base. There is not a very widely accepted diagnostic criteria, and there's no clear guideline in terms of how long you should treat them for and what you should look for on follow-up 
um, in order to terminate treatment. So this obviously has de delayed diagnosis. A lot of patients um, have gotten conflicting recommendations and the patient's extremely frustrated, basically telling them, you're gonna be on antibiotics for a month. They're just super frustrated. And obviously in this case, but in particular, this early cessation of the antibiotics led to recurrence and progression of the disease, which is significant for this patient. We will go, uh, it will have a happy ending, but uh, that scared me. So I hopefully um, in, in today's, uh, short lecture, we will give you a brief examination of the clinical presentations of skull-based osteomyelitis. We will review the diagnostic workup necessary if, as a resident. Hopefully, you keep that in mind next time you see one uh, in the ED or as an inpatient consult. And we will give you a, a few toolboxes in, in order to come up with a treatment plan. So to clear up terminology, a typical skull-based osteomyelitis is considered otologic in origin, so coming from an ear infection. It's uh, also known as malignant otitis externa or necrotizing otitis externa. So those are the terminologies we uh, usually use, and uh, the skull base can uh, extend contralateral or towards the middle uh, uh, immediately. Atypical skull base osteomyelitis is considered non otologic in origin. It affects ma mainly the central skull base first, and the epicenter usually surrounds the clivus and sphenoid. Um, patients may have history of sinus disease or sinus surgeries in the past. And, uh, but when the skull base osteo is so bad and it basically involves entire skull base, it's hard to say what triggered what. So um, th that's just nomenclature for you to start thinking about how to classify the patient. Uh, we know in the epidemiology, actually the study came from Dr. Lambert, your chair. The, one of the major reviews is from Dr. Lambert's group. Um, the average age is usually elderly patient, right? The average age is 67.8, you know, in Northern Florida, where just the average is age in my patient clinic is probably over, over 70. So um, uh, it's just right, right in my uh, neck of woods. And uh, there is a male predominance in a significant risk factors, most of patients are diabetes. So when you have a, uh, a patient with severe ear pain, you have to think about diabetes, diabetes, diabetes. Um, and immunosuppression, you know, like the patient we have in the case presentation, there are transplant patients or their HIV and other risk factors include, you know, the chronic comorbidities and also radiation, you know, if they had a head and neck radiation or um, brain radiation, it puts them at risk as well. Other more rare pathologies include osteoporosis and Paget disease. And on the right-hand side, you see a um, really bad uh, uh, skull-based osteo that basically the entire skull is just melting away. So those are disaster cases. Hopefully, we will prevent uh, from getting there. Um, I, I feel like I never saw really too many of osteomyelitis, but it's increasingly more common because the age population in the United States and in the world is aging and is increasing incidence of diabetes and immunosuppression, such as transplant patients that uh, survive. And you see on the right hand side, the chart right here that pay people who are over six, age 65, you know, more than 20 percent of them will have uh, known or underdiagnosed diabetes as a significant proportion of the population that you guys will come to treat and care for. So uh, you'll definitely see skull-based osteo. And with the current, there are multiple etiology contributing to the decreasing cure rate that this is coming from Dr. Lambert's uh, review that, you know, if you divided all the literature reviews before and after 2009, the cure rate, the way, the the, we, our ability to get rid of the disease seems to be decreasing. Why is that? We'll talk about briefly in our presentation. And the mortality it can be quite high, obviously, depending on how severe the present at the presentation, um, the mortality rate, just wanted to highlight, can be uh, as high as 50%. So it's something definitely to uh, take seriously with. Um, some, some what to look for in patients, you'll see a lot of ear pain patients, you'll see probably, especially in an otology clinic, a lot of people come in with pain. The pain that is um, alarming to me that makes me think about skull-based osteomyelitis is that it's so deeply seated. Patients are extremely uncomfortable. That is out of proportion to what, you're, what you can find on clinical exam. They may also complain about very vague headache. And, you know, obviously this probably more applies to the patients who have sinus diseases. And they've been on rounds and rounds of PO and topical antibiotics without improvement. That makes me think about, okay, what are we doing differently? 
uh, if are we missing something? And the one thing we're probably missing is skull-based osteomyelitis. Patients may have ear drainage, hearing loss, and when they have when they have intracranial uh, complications, you know, the family, if, especially if you're seeing them inpatient or in an ED, you might find them a little lethargic with altered mental status. So you are maintaining a very high suspicion for skull-based osteomyelitis. And a really interesting uh, thing is that in really high risk patients, you know, in my my in, uh, case presentation, the patient's diabetic, high blood pressure, um, has kidney transplant. He's extremely high risk for skull based osteo. So really minor procedures can trigger it. So ear lavage, the primary cares love to ear lavage, and that can actually just light the whole skull base on fire. The Q-tip injuries, ear surgery. So that in the case presentation, the patient actually had uh, meringotomy tubes placed. So that's it. You know, that's all you need to trigger that. Other cases include um, sinus surgery or head trauma. Um, and, and one of my senior um, partners actually said, you know, one time he did a SAPI surgery and the patient was extremely high risk and, and ended up having skull-based osteomyelitis. So something to consider, um, especially if you're seeing some elderly patients. What you can find on exam, the most common finding is granulation tissue at the bony cartilaginous junction, as you can see on the picture right here. And the ear canal is usually extremely swollen. You can't really put any speculum in. You can barely get a good exam. And sometimes you may find ulcerations um, or uh, erosions of the bone and cartilage with bone exposure. So that is very high suspicion for skull based osseo. Obviously, if you have granulation or ulcer, you have to biopsy it for, to rule out malignancy. Um, if you're dealing with a potential central um, osteomyelitis, patients may have um, sinus symptoms. And cranial nerve paralysis or palsy can be involved in up to a quarter percent of a quarter of the patients. And facial nerve is the most commonly involved nerve. I generally scope those patients to make sure there's not a nasopharyngeal bio, uh, pathology like nasopharyngeal carcinoma to make sure that this isn't coming from the eustachian tube or uh, due to a nasopharyngeal pathology. And obviously, if they're coming in to the ear clinic, they have hearing loss. Uh, we gen gen generally send them next door for a hearing test at baseline. Um, uh, obviously, when your suspicion for skull-based osteomyelitis is high and they end up, end up getting either admitted to the hospital or getting a medicine workup, um, a lot of the laboratory findings can be alarmingly normal. So in a diabetic foot, so in the counterpart of the skull base is a foot osteo, like lower extremity osteomyelitis. They have a really nice algorithm. They're able to show that if your numbers are above certain, that you're more likely to have osteomyelitis. And it's extremely not true in skull base osteomyelitis. So that's something you are sort of argue back and forth with infectious disease um, uh, uh, experts. That a lot of times they can have very normal white count. They have very normal CRP because those people are chronically, chronically immunosuppressed. Um, they may have mildly elevated ESR, which people argue that you can monitor the ESR over time. And in people who have uh, um, comorbidities, Usually those people, the diabetes is poorly controlled, so their uh, hemoglobin A1C is extremely elevated. And, and kidney disease patients, that creatinine can be significantly elevated in an episode of skull-based osteo. So those are just some of the labs you might find. Um, when we take a culture, what's the most common pathogen in a uh, otitis externa is true for, and you know, the garden variety OE and the malignant OE, which is skull-based osteo. Pseudomonas is the key player. It can be as common as 90% of those patients. So you really have to find a medication that has anti-pseudomonal coverage. The problem with pseudomonas is that because we're using so much ofloxacin and anti-pseudomonal medicine, there's an increased rate of multi-drug resistance. Um, and pseudomonas is particularly um, aggressive because the bacteria is being known to release enzymes that cause necrotic vasculitis, increasing their ability to, to re erode bone and invade other other uh, tissue, soft tissue. Um, other uh, pathogens you might find, staph aureus, and fungal infection is increasingly more common, aspergillosis uh, in Canada and mucor. And those fungal infections can occur with even without any diabetes or immunosuppression, so key factor to keep in mind that when your cultures are negative, really got to send it for fungal, um, when bacterial uh, fungals, bacterial cultures are negative, get a scent for fungal culture. 
Um, and when patient, patients present at the presentation have severe vascular complications or intracranial extension, we really got to make sure it's not fungal and not just treating it with broad spectrum antibiotics. And there are some polymicrobial cases reported in the literature. So a detection of pathogen is really, really important so we can guide the downstream treatment plan and evaluation. Um, there is a very high rate of negative culture, especially in skull-based osteomyelitis. A lot of patients, by the time they turn up to the subspecialty clinic, you know, by the time they turn to the tertiary neurotology clinic, they've been through the ED, the primary care, the um, the local ENT, maybe or even your general ENT in the in the in the academic practice. And by the time they turn up to your office, they might have just been on antibiotics for so long the culture is negative so that is a significant problem so what we end up doing is sending all the cultures for pcr which is known to be more effective than uh, just um, bacterial or fungal cultures detect to detect pathogen so this is this study is not uh, based on scar based osteomyelitis but it's to illustrate the point that for a middle year effusion if you just do uh, regular bacterial culture you may have 24 percent positive rate with the culture, but with the PCR, you're able to achieve 92% uh, culture positive for identification of pathogen, which is uh, quite uh, significantly better. So um, if you have the ability uh, to send a PCR, I would highly recommend it. Um, in terms of imaging, this is probably a key component of your diagnostic workup because it, you need something to confirm the osteomyelitis at the skull base. So we will look at the CT, MRI, and nuclear medicine scans. So uh, usually CT, we use it. Oh, CT, we use it to look for bony erosion, so look for signs of demineralization. And MRIs, obviously, for the junior residents, you probably um, know that, or, or for the residents, you probably know that soft tissue involvement, and intracranial um, identification is very important to look for. And then we generally reserve the nuclear medicine scans for the non-diagnostic. Uh, Patients who had CT and MRIs are not very obvious. Um, nuclear medicine skin, and depending on where you practice, may not be immediately available. So there are certain limitations. And I use nuclear medicine scans to follow the disease progression. Um, in order to know what you're looking for on the on the imaging studies, you also have to know what else you're not looking for. So are, what are you ruling out? So differential diagnosis is quite broad. Um, but if you look at it, most of it is tumor. We're trying to re rule out malignancy, ear canal carcinoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Um, the sinonasal diseases are really uh, more the central osteomyelitis. And I've had a, a couple solitary plasma cytomas at the skull base, which is uh, unusual, but keep in mind. Lymphoma and metastatic diseases, obviously those patients are probably your inpatient consults with uh, metastasis to the skull base. And others we've seen, um, I've had a, a lady with really bad uh, Wegner's that involved the skull base, and she's it's it's just miserable. So um, those are your differential diagnoses for the skull base osteomyelitis lesions. So give you a couple examples of what it looks like on imaging. Obviously, on CT scan, you're looking for bony erosion and demineralization. However, the bone has to be significantly involved before it shows up on uh, abnormal on CT, just like our case presentation. You know, initially he actually had a CT scan that was relatively normal because the bone has not been demineralized enough to show up on CT scan. And CT scan has a false negative rate of 40%. So most of the patients probably, you know, at very, very early on would not have an abnormal CT. And the CT does not allow you to pick up progression or a significantly um, more ex uh, bone involvement. You also will use CT scan soft tissue window to look at obliteration of fat planes, uh, EAC thickening, and obviously fluid collection for abscesses and extension into the nasal pharynx. So this is a CT scan of the patient in the case presentation. You can see this is the right set CT temporal bone at the level of the mastery air cells. This is the middle ear space, is the mass uh, rate air cells. The right ear actually is relatively normal, even though there is central uh, ex, um, involvement. Compared to the left ear, you see there are bony changes, loss of bony architecture to suggest bony erosion. And the, the coronal CT scan shows you the demineralization. We can see the graying and fuzziness of those all those air cells. So that's what you're looking for on CT scan. Um, and then if I bring his uh, zoom out on his CT scan, 
you can see uh, this is uh, the index patient. So left ear started first, extending to the right skull base, and that's why he has bilateral severe otalgia. So it's basically um, caught, on, caught on fire on this right-hand side as well. And then the back of the nasal pharynx, um, the radiologist had called invasive and uh, infiltrative lesion. You can see bony losses anteriorly right here. So I actually scoped him and took a biopsy in the nasal pharynx to make sure there's no nasal pharyngeal carcinoma as well. So those are just um, some key features of CT scan. On the MRI, um, what you're looking for are, you know, early signs of skull-based osseo. You know, what 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 can you see? Uh, the key uh, things are bone marrow changes, which is a replacement of normal fat signals on T1. Um, and you can see heterogeneous enhancement on T1 with contrast, and there's an increased T2 signal. The bone marrow changes are, can be seen in the petrous apex, the sp uh, sphenoid bone, and also the occipital bone in the back as well. Um, unfortunately, those bone marrow changes can change, can persist up to 12 months. So once you get the MRI, you confirm the osteomyelitis. It doesn't really tell you whether the patient is getting better or not. So that's one of the limitations of MRI. Obviously, also shows you a soft tissue extension, intracranial involvement as well. So this is the index case. You see, this is the relatively normal side of the uh, petrix apex. Bone marrow signal on T1 without contrast is bright. So this is the normal bone marrow signal. On the left-hand side, you can see starting to see some early loss of that bone marrow signal, which is characteristic finding for skull-based osteomyelitis. And you see this uh, enhancement, this is a T1 with contrast enhancement in the uh, mastery bone as well as the petrous uh, bone as well. And then this is the increased, this T2 signal, increased T2 signal in that entire uh, temporal bone area. So uh, those are key uh, MRI findings. And this is c coming from a report that you can also see involvement of the soft tissue, uh, cavernous sinus, and also extending into the a masticator space in the soft tissue in, with the muscle. So uh, this is just coming out of a uh, published report. This is what you can expect to see on the MRI. Uh, one important uh, um, sequence on MRI, if you were having a high suspicion for a skull-based osseo, make sure you communicate with the neuroradiology team to obtain the diffusion-weighted uh, images, depending on what the um, machine is, you may ask for epi DWI, it's also called DWI haze or DWI blay. Those are different methods of image acquisition, but basically you're looking for diffusion weighted images. Um, when th what they're looking for on the DWI sequences is the restricted motion of water molecule. When the water molecule re become restricted, it becomes bright on the DWI sequence. Why certain molecules become restricted? Because if there's uh, increased cell uh, permeability, cell density, protein, basically is a sequence we often use to monitor infarction, infection, tumor, valerian degeneration, and also demyelinization disease. So this is an example of an MRI. So you see this is the MRI T1 without contrast. There is loss. Uh, this is at presentation and this is at follow-up when the, uh, the disease has um, um, resolved. There's fall uh, loss of bone marrow signal, just like we showed you earlier. Bone marrow signal has been lost in the uh, skull, at the skull base. When you give it contrast, this is heterogeneous enhancement. Um, and there's increased signal on T2 and on the DWI, you can see there's water and there is restriction of that signal at the skull base. So this is um, what you look for on DWI. And when the uh, infection has resolved, you can see um, that the DWI restriction has um, gone away. So that's just a, a really cool MRI sequence you can ask for. Um, also keep in mind, especially if you're dealing with a lot of ear patients, other things may also be bright on DWI. I think this may even come uh, become important in your in-service exam, cholesteatoma, epidermal cysts, abscess, chondrosarcomas, and lymphomas are DWI bright lesions. This is, you know, they love to, to um, ask you to distinguish chondrosarcoma versus chordoma. You just have to know which one is DWI bright. So the most important thing for the ear canal is that cholesteatomas can be bright. So if you know there's a cholesteatoma, um, we actually use DWI to look for cholesteatoma as well. 
Um, and then we won't go into details, but just so you know that this is on your horizon, the apparent diffusion coefficient ADCs has been studied as a method to evaluate, uh, to distinguish malignant versus benign skull-based lesions. And, and actually, interestingly enough, the malignant lesions tend to have lower ADC value. So you don't have to remember that, but just so you know that there is a method to look for it. Um, other methods, including nuclear medicine, um, I don't know how much nuclear medicine you guys see, uh, but uh, it's actually quite confusing. I, I was extremely confused by nuclear medicine scans. I just know as a resident, if the attending tell you to order a nuclear medicine scan, you order it, but then exactly what you're looking for, it's extremely confusing. So just to give you a primer, there are spec CTs and PET CTs and PET MRI as well. You probably are familiar with the PET scans, you know, the PET scans for head and neck cancer. Um, but very similar, there are nuclear medicine scans, and the SPECT CT uh, stands for Single Photon Emission Computer Tomography. You can actually combine that with CT or MRI. And the PET uh, scan is stand for Positron uh, Emission Tomography. And the two of them, just to give you an example, this is not looking at osteo skull based osteomyelitis, which you're not looking for a tiny lesion, but this comes into play uh, for paraganglioma lesions when you're looking for some very, very small lesions. So, the PET scan, you know, on the right-hand side, in comparison, has just better spatial resolution than a SPECT scan. So you probably never get tested on that, but I figure if anybody were going to show you what that looks like, this is what they look like. In terms of skull-based osteomyelitis, um, you know, we often order two scans, either the bone scan or the white uh, blood cell scan. The Technetium 99 scan and the Gallium scan those two names refer to the radio isotope that you're going to give in the radio tracer. So you combine that with CT or MRI and when you uh, when you uh, put them in a scanner. Whereas PET scan, you're giving them radio uh, isotope, which is the glucose, the radio tagged uh, glucose, um, which is FDG, and you put them in either in the CT or MRI. And the sensitivity of technetium scan is quite good. It's 85%. Um, gallium scan is not as good as only 71%, but, but it's a lot more specific. I'll show, show you why. And the glucose FDG PET scan is extremely sensitive, but really, uh, again, just you probably know that from PET scan for head and neck cancers. It's very sensitive, but not very specific at all. So the technetium scan, can you see that uh, skeleton moving? <laughs> Okay, so the technetium scan is also called a bone scan. It's used to detect osteoblastic activity. It's very sensitive, but not very specific because it can be positive in malignancy and as well as trauma. It can be abnormal within 24 to 40 hours of the disease onset. So it's a good scan to get when you're trying to diagnose it. However, it cannot differentiate between active inflammation versus remodeling, which also has osteoblastic activity. So this is the SPEC scan. Um, of the patient we saw in the case. And if once you combine it with a CT scan, you can see you can localize that infection a lot better. And the gallium scan is what we called a white blood cell scan. It detects an increase in acute phase reactants and by binding to white blood cells. And it's very, sp it may not be very uh, sensitive, but it's a lot more specific for infection. This is why, uh, also because it especially binds to white blood cells. And, and you can use it to monitor disease uh, resolution. It offers very low anatomic resolution without com combining it with a CT scan. So you can see here, it doesn't really give you any spatial, re spatial resolution, but you can probably see where it is when you can combine it with a CT scan. So that's really cool. So in the case presentation, in my case, what happened is then, you know, he was confirmed with a technique bone scan and the white blood cell scan with a skull based osteomyelitis has been on antibiotics for a long time. We actually stopped it. And by the time he came back with the facial paralysis, you can see the disease has progressed and even the contralateral side has uh, worsened. So that's also seen in gallium scan as well. So I got smart. I went into a deep dive into this osteomyelitis world. And I decided with the infectious disease doctor that we were going to keep him on IV antibiotics for a long time. So I saw him back at five months. He was actually asymptomatic. He was begging to come off of the IV antibiotics. So we got a gallium scan. It was still positive. And I said, Mr. So-and-so, I'm so sorry. You got to be on IV antibiotics still. Um, so he was on it for a long time, for, uh, for almost 10 months. And he was asymptomatic. He finally was negative on gallium scan. So boom, he came off of the antibiotics. We were so happy. 
And then, uh, you know, based on the literature review, it is recommended to follow up with a repeat scan. So we repeated the gallium and the technetium. He was still negative at one year. So thankfully, even though, uh, you know, I see him in clinic uh, uh, once in a while, he's been negative so far. So uh, finally, that's my happy ending to that haunted house. We escaped uh, in one piece. See, I think that's a great point. We've had somebody on antibiotics for a year, and I think that they lived through that. Um, but from from our standpoint, um, our infectious disease team likes to use single agent, if at all possible. And in training, uh, when I went through training, it was always two antibiotics with anti pseudomonal coverage. One of the antibiotics generally very bad for you, meaning yeah. your kidneys. Um, yeah. And uh, but Cipro is nice orally, and um, but we are generally doing single agent um, ourselves here. And sorry if I missed that earlier in your talk, if you cover that. But what are you guys typically doing down in Gainesville? So yeah, we will downgrade to um, a single agent if they can, um, and sometimes if the infectious disease early on, the first six to eight weeks, they will put them on double cover just in case. It's a polymicrobial, and only one, you know one bacteria is showing up because by the time I get a hold of them, they've been on antibodies for so long that the infectious disease always argues that maybe we're not getting the culture that we we need. So once they show clinical improvement, uh, for this guy actually, the, the infectious disease had it kept him on IV levaquin for a long time until they finally downgraded him to PO levaquin just to give it deliver uh, better penetration to the bone. So our infectious disease team, uh, uh, he also has a renal transplant, so infectious disease team uh, follows very closely because of the comorbidities and the renal function and the liver function they have to manage. We've had about 10 patients here that the only thing we've grown is P. acnes, and we think it's, it's a pathogen and um, shouldn't be, right, pimple bug, but um, we, we do think that's been the cause of this, either coming this way or from the ear in yeah. about 10 patients. And yeah. when, if that's all we grow nowadays and we have any suspicion, we treat. Right, right. And so this patient, I don't know if you saw in the beginning, he actually was culture negative times too. So I had to take him to the, to the OR from Mastroy for a culture and bi tissue biopsy. Uh, uh, because he, he, he was in a hospital for so long that the cultures uh, were negative for so long. I waited for so long. I was over it, so I took him to, from a, for a biopsy. So um, so, um, so moving forward, the PET scan, obviously, is a radio uh, isotope attack to glucose. Um, basically, measures the glucose metabolism and in infection, and it can be positive in inf inflammation as well as neoplasm, so it's not quite as uh, specific. The average SUV actually is known um, from the review. It's about 5.9, and interestingly enough, the fungal skull-based osteomyelitis is a little bit lower than bacterial. It's quite sensitive, up to 96%. Um, the good news is a pet skin, you can probably get it uh, uh, pretty commonly. Um, most uh, centers will have it. Uh, if you have nuclear medicine skin, I still rely mostly on nuclear medicine skin, even though uh, apparently the pet skin is more sensitive. Um, and some people have been have been using it to monitor the resolution of skull-based osteomyelitis. So um, a little bit of discussion about role of surgery, since we are all surgeons. Um, the rate of surgery, actually, this is from Dr. Lambert's group, uh, to, to look at over time, is there a need uh, for surgery so, and then is there a reduction in the, those extensive resection and debridement? The rate of surgery of local surgery, just like mastoiditis or a biopsy when they're under sedation or um, uh, uh, um, uh, but mostly um, uh, sinus surgery or mastoiditis to get biopsy is stable over time, you know, up to 20% you, of time you have to take them to OR for something. However, the extensive surgeries, the debridement, the um, resection have decreased because we have been able to uh, do, do a whole lot more with antibiotics. Again, um, I took that case presentation patient for uh, to rule out malignancy in the nose as well in the ear, and also gave um, a better tissue for organization organism identification and sensitivity assay. I've had one patient who had an abscess at a slidal mastery foramen that I had to take 
to remove. And obviously, when there are intracranial complications, you got to work closely with the with the neurosurgery team to to alleviate that. Um, in and this is often talked about with my senior partners, but I haven't had to do one, fortunately. That when they have not responded to a culture directed antibiotics uh, regimen for a long time, and there usually is a fungal infection, local debridement has been uh, found to be helpful. I don't know if that's the uh, experience at MUSC or not, but I have not had to uh, write, I have not gotten into that haunted house. So um, thankfully, but um, I'm sure there are cases. And and I, sorry, Dr. Myers. No, I was just going to say, um, we uh, we wrote this up a long time ago. Sean Stevens was lead author on that paper. He's out in Arizona now. Um, we looked at uh, what was out in the literature and then here, and fungus seems to be bad. Invasion elsewhere seems to be bad. We've generally also been a conservative approach. Um, uh, let the antibiotics or antifungals or both do their job for as long as need be. And your 10 month patient is a great example. Um, there's some evidence and some statistics to, um, to uh, support that, that in advanced um, cases, uh, that catch up's ne not necessarily so good to, you can't necessarily get out in front of it because you're behind to start with, but to get in and to do something. Um, we just did a case fairly recently where the mastoid actually looked fine, but then when we got deep to the facial um, and down to the jugular bulb, there, jugular bulb, there was all sorts of just inflammatory material down there. And, um, you know, it's almost like you're not doing a whole lot, but then just getting in and scraping out the material, even though it doesn't look like pus and it doesn't look like just gross infection, um, helps, just helps. That bone yeah. doesn't really have good blood supply. It takes a long time for the antibiotics to work. So, yeah, um, yeah I think I think if you're thinking uh, not, not pseudo-surgery to do pseudo-surgery, so... The patient that I'm talking about had already had a mastoid done locally, which was one drill bit into the mastoid. So that was not a mastoidectomy. So um, I think if you're thinking to do surgery, you almost need to think about large skull base approach with this and get out as much crud as you can, uh, right. because this is, this is clearly a life-threatening problem. Definitely, definitely. Um, and, and I definitely... Uh, was was so ready to decompress that nerve when when the, he he presented uh, with the facial paralysis, but um, you know Pat Antonelli talked me out of it. <laughs> His wisdom came into play because that's that's a smart guy. Yeah, so you just know after literature review that the nerve decompression probably may not uh, do a whole lot of good. But like you said, when you know very advanced, you have to prepare for a large skull base approach. So um, that the role of nerve depression, it may be debated. Um, some of the things I wanted to bring to your attention, especially as residents or fellows, you know, we, we think about, oh, you know, when they come in with the ear infection or ear pain, we're gonna start them on drops and deal with it later. But the prolonged antibiotic drops in the, the immune suppressed and diabetic patients actually lead to a high rate of seroculture. And a very uh, problematic, a very big problem we have is increasing is resistance, especially in the pseudomonal um, infections. And when you combine it with the steroid drops, you know, it actually reduces the local immune response and leads to secondary fungal infection. So every time you start somebody on drops, you got to make sure I now I know that I'm going to make sure I'm treating the right thing by just topical uh, uh, antibiotic drops. And um, like we talked about, oral antibiotics has a limited role initially when you have skull-based osteo because they have very uh, bad necrotic bone. And as you can see in this 3D, you can see this is the 3D recon of that patient. Um, as you can see, I've spent a lot of time looking at his scans, even had a 3D recon, is that the, you know, the extensive skull-based bone loss is uh, quite, quite impressive and there's no way for the oral antibiotics to deliver good drugs to that area. So the IV antibiotics is very necessary and we kept them on it for a long time. Usually infectious disease will go at least 68 weeks, six to eight weeks, but um, in some patients may be needed for much longer. 
And currently, there is insufficient evidence to suggest that hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which you know, we know works for lower extremity osteomyelitis, there's not enough evidence to suggest that HBO works for skull-based osteo. So I don't put them on it. I don't know if the MUSC experience may be uh, uh, pointing to HBO or not. Um, and my main problem with the this patient are that brought me to dive deeper in this case is when do we stop IV intubators? When am I going to be done? Um, and uh, what 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 imaging modality is best to know that the disease is uh, you know resolved and to monitor for recurrence for and for treatment response? So that was a significant challenge. And hopefully you have seen that the MRI scans can help and your nuclear medicine scans can help. And some of the complications we've mentioned, uh, cranial nerve palsy, and obviously when patients are having other intracranial um, issues like meningitis, infarcts, or epidural abscess, we involve neurosurgery to, to, um, to, to help manage. And for thrombosis, I definitely had a couple of patients that had sigmoid sinus thrombosis, um, extending to transverse and jugular bulb, and obviously the central skull base patients can have cavernous sinus thrombosis as well. And there, I, there is no evidence to suggest a sinus decompression will help, uh, but our infectious disease people and hematology team seem to recommend uh, anticoagulation, which is a significant undertaking in somebody who is already quite, uh, co has a lot of comorbidity. So uh, um, that's usually a discussion with a multidisciplinary team. Um, and this one other challenge is that because Pseudomonas is the most common infectious agent, um, anti-pseudomonal drugs are extremely difficult, and the quinolones are the uh, primary oral components, and all the other ones are, you know, IV forms and have significant, significant adverse reactions. So uh, most of them are nephrotoxic and nephrotoxics and hepatotoxic with a potential for myelosuppression. And I, there's nothing like a skull-based osteomyelitis patient to remind you that the uh, the, the Greek word of the Greek origin for pharmacology or pharmacy, pharmacon actually means poison. So really you're trying to poison the patient and the bacteria at the same time, hoping that the patient will survive and the bacteria will die. So um, in a lot of the uh, quinolone patients, uh, I have had trouble with the quinolone uh, medications because they interact with warfarin and, and cause the QT prolongation. So some of the cardiac patients can't be on quinolones and cefepime, which is the patient, one patient was on cefepime, you know, there's an increased risk for encephalopathy and seizures and also causes um, kidney disease. So in a renal transplant patient, the, the transplant team is extremely unhappy with me. And then we won't even go into the antifungals because we know that amphotericins are amphoterrible. And then vericonazole, which is a milder, you know, milder Asian, there's a risk of pancreatitis. So there's just no good options. So it, it, with the infectious disease console, we talk really long and hard in terms of what to put the patients on and the, their own pick line and always look out for pick line infection and thrombosis that can be leading to DVT. So those are just many, many reasons to involve the medicine team in infectious disease and the neuroradiology and the neurosurgeon team as neurosurgery team as well. So um, hopefully uh, that was a very quick summary uh, that you've I've been able to show that in very high risk patients, diabetic patients and transplant patients, hopefully you are, you know, to culture early in order to reduce the chances of a sterile culture. Um, and sometimes even in skull-based osteomyelitis, which is not a surgical disease, that we have to do surgery to perform tissue biopsy in order to rule out malignancy and also obtain culture. Um, we generally obtain a baseline CT and MRI guided by a nuclear medicine scan, either a PET scan or spec, uh, spec CT scan with bone scan or white mitre scan that allows you to um, uh, diagnose, confirm the diagnosis also to monitor the progression. And a very, very long-term culture-directed therapy usually is necessary until the resolution of the clinical signs as well as radiographic disease is obtained. And, and basically, it's a very long discussion with the patient. You don't need that many patients with a skull-based osteomyelitis to feel like you're basically uh, uh, overwhelmed. So I, I definitely I think uh, is was a good lesson learned um, and generally a follow-up exam and imaging especially if you decide a nuclear medicine scan or a PET scan uh, or MRI to monitor to catch early recurrence is very beneficial in those patients and and actually uh, for me I've started recently 
that any minor procedure in very high risk patient diabetic renal transplant, I generally look at the, I check the past medical history a lot more careful now because if they have any, if they have very high risk, even if I just clean their ears or do a myringotomy or, you know, like a very minor procedure, I put them on antibiotics to prevent sp skull based osteo maybe. It's just me being scared of skull-based osseo now, but Dr. Mary can weigh in as well. Well, we're scared of it too. Mallory, how many people have you seen die from this in a year and a half? No one die. Um, we had one cancer patient who was quite complicated, not very straightforward immunosuppressed diabetic skull-based osteo, but uh essentially skull based osteo osteoradial necrosis uh temporal lobe abscess and she came pretty close um but i think she's the only one yeah this is um uh we've cancer or or cancer treatment obviously tough adds another level of complexity here um we we um, weren't seeing this a lot when I started. Then we started to see a lot. Um, I think our worst year, five or six patients died. Um, I think we've gotten the word out a little better. We've done some writing on it. Um, we talk about it in our literature courses. We send out some uh, information to our referring docs. And um, hopefully it's being caught sooner on the outside, not just nothing or just drops. Um, you know, not not or inadequate treatment for a while. So we've we've still seen a couple of bad ones, um, but yeah, I don't think we've had anybody die for a while. So um, yeah, hopefully this is this is a beautiful talk. See, so this is oh, this you. is great. And um, yeah, you don't you don't really want to see this either. I mean, it's fun to do our big surgeries, but it's right. terrible for these patients. So. Right. Uh, like you said, like you just need, I just, I just, I have a few once in a while, and every time I get one, it just haunts me. Yeah. Uh, so the yeah. the subtitle of the talk was how to escape the haunted house, and and one of the things I learned from my second, my youngest kid is that instead of uh, running away from the problem, you got to just run towards the haunted house, and it will be uh, probably a better solution. So that's him yesterday running towards the to grab the witch. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, hopefully um, the more you educate people within an hour or two of you, hopefully that will save patients some of the burden um, and save you some of the burden of having to, to deal with this stuff because this stuff doesn't come in with good timing. People are sick. You're trying to do this in the evening or, or on the weekends or uh, when you're waiting to go to an interview or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, inopportune times because because you're busy otherwise it's just hard to hard to plan for doing this sort of stuff right and um, yeah six weeks of IV antibiotics is bad enough but mm -hmm. you know thank goodness you kept that patient on for almost a year and and um, you know it didn't destroy their gut and they're and they're alive um, to to continue um, and maybe even get their diabetes under better control and, and whatever else was the problem yeah, I think the renal transplant not going anywhere, but <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was a that was a great talk. Thank great you. Talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Questions, guys. I have a question, Dr. Chen. Yes, we we you kind of discussed it a little bit, and Dr. Meyer brought it up. Um, one thing that I still struggle with is in a patient who you suspect skull base osteo, you have cultures, you're starting to treat. At, what are the things that go into the decision to take the patient back for surgery? If facial paralysis develops, if you don't see significant improvement at a six week mark, and I know it, it can't be totally protocolized, but what are some of those things that you think about? Yeah, so, you know, I haven't had to take that many to the OR. Obviously, the literature says 20%, but I haven't had to take that many to the OR. But I assume, you know, if they don't have uh, symptomatic improvement and if you have imaging to show progression, um, generally, I guess you could ta consider taking them for uh, mastoid or some other, you know, sinus surgery for biopsy and culture. 
but our infectious disease doctor actually generally tells me to repeat the scan in two months. So we do the re nuclear medicine scan every two months. So it will, because a lot of that pain will take a long time to resolve. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, they, it's because a nuclear medicine scan here, I don't know about MUSC, also takes a while to schedule. <laughs> so Same by the here. time you schedule them, they're either better or not better. So you just uh, wait for the nuclear medicine scan. So, But we are fortunate to have a very good nuclear medicine uh, a neuroradiologist. Um, uh, I think if you were like in a community hospital, that might not be available, yeah. Oh. Okay. Other questions? Well, if no other questions, we might uh, just call it. All right. Well, it's great to be with you guys. What a great team you guys have over there. And thank you so much for the invite, Mallory. You're, you're doing great things. So uh, thank you, Dr. Meyer, for, for chatting as well. Thanks again for your time, Dr. Chen. Great talk. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.